Tremendous and curious world of Beakerhead. You were in for an unbelievable evening. Beakerhead is a smash up of art, science, engineering. But I've got to tell you, this is a, incredibly, a supremely unique night. It's going to be tremendous. There's so much cool engineering and technology, fantastic music, but it's also going to be curious. I promise you that. And that's what Beakerhead is all about. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take people. And you know, I, like, I don't like to be characterized as, I don't mind being called the science guy or the discovery guy, but I like art and culture and I love music. So why should I be pigeonholed? And I'm sure that all of you are pretty much the same. So we want to break down those barriers. We want to create things that are tremendous and curious because you bring ideas, not just from arts, not just from engineering, not just from science, but from everywhere, bring them together. You create incredibly ingenious ideas. And you know what? You put it all together, it is a beautiful thing. not and probably don't know about Lauren, she has a master's in physics. <laughs> so before we talk about that, could you just uh, uh, explain a little bit about the piece you just sang? Well, I just sang an aria from Carmen, and one of the reasons I chose it, other than it's one of my favorite roles, is Carmen is filled with passion. And about a little while ago, when I was deciding between physics or opera, they were my two passions, and I felt that, why not sing a song about passion? So, it, but it does seem, uh, even though we're all beaker headers here, it, that does seem an unusual choice to have to make. Am I going to be a physicist, or am I going to sing <laughs> arias from Carmen? So is there a commonality between the two? Um, I don't think there's a commonality except the fact that I love them both. There's definitely a connection, my area of physics was optical physics. After sort of studying through particle physics for a while, astronomy for a while, I, I ended with optical. And my master's degree was building a laser. And I sometimes picture the body as a laser. It may really? sound really strange, but um, with am um, ampli amplification and resonance and color, all these words are the same words um, used when, when, with lasers. So that in, in that way, I, I, I see them the same. <laughs> Big, small, louder than the thunder. Big, small, taller than the storm. Big, small, rise above these troubles. Lift us up and keep him safe and warm. And I don't know why we ride on the flame. Cause sometimes we're right in line All I know is the future is waiting Out there for us to find Big small, 10,000 years of building Big small, all the careful Not the first to rise and not the last Oh, and I don't know why we ride on the flame Cause sometimes we're right in line All I know is the future is waiting Out there for us to find Says 
it's easy Big small, more fragile than you see Big small, carry precious cargo Show us how to live and how to dream And big small, dropping from the heavens Big small, returning to your earth Joy and bring it back to earth. Ah, and big smoke, bring us back our brother. Oh, bring us joy and bring him back to earth. I'll tell you one thing that uh, Chris just told me today. It's four months today that he landed in Kazakhstan. Back on Earth. Yeah. And it's nice to be back. And I would say we're happy to have him back. Now, with, with these boots on Earth. Yeah, yes, sir. He even let us put a tiny little country and western uh, lilt to that song, Big Smoke, which he wrote uh, with his brother, I think, in 1995. The first time I flew in space uh, was to help build the uh, Russian space station Mir back in 1995. And uh, that song was written by my brother. Um, and I flew it on board with me on a piece of paper. So that song's important in our family, but it's uh, one of the early folk songs of space flight as well. So it's really nice to, yeah. really nice to have. So we've asked him tonight if he would give us a short little portrait gallery of some of the things that struck him most when he was on the ISS. Chris. So picture yourself uh, floating, weightless, inside a little aluminum bubble, a human creation going eight kilometers a second uh, f from, from here to Edmonton in uh, 40 seconds. <laughs> Uh, across the country, nine minutes, around the world, every 92 minutes, floating inside that, that human creation of the International Space Station, floating down out of node one into node three, uh, head first down into the cupola, you grab a camera, and the world is rolling by underneath you, and you see things like that, like the Bahamas, which to me, when, when, uh, when I'm looking at the world, the most beautiful, the most striking, uh, just richness of deep, beautiful, inherent color is the Bahamas, the huge reefs. I've been diving there, the, the tongue of the ocean that comes in so deep, and then all the endless shallow blue reefs. The Bahamas uh, are one of the most beautiful things on the world. And when you get a chance on board and you know the Bahamas are coming, you stop what you're doing, you get down, you grab a camera, and you watch them go by. They're, they're just beautiful. <laughs> uh, this is uh, uh, like the eye of the desert. It's it's called the Rishat structure. It's actually like a big salt dome, a big uh, multi-layered stone dome that is slowly over the thousands and thousands of years on the edge of the Sahara, been whittled away and rubbed smooth like a polished stone on your finger um, uh, down in, into what looks like as you fly over in your spaceship, like the world has a big unblinking eyeball looking at you coming uh, across the planet. Remember, when you're on board a spaceship, you almost always take pictures in the direction you're going. But it's really important to turn around backwards and see where you've just been, because sometimes the view is even better that way. And that's how this picture was taken. We were coming across the prairies, came down, we were headed towards Boston, and uh, it had been a nice day over the Great Lakes. But I grabbed the camera and spun around quick with a 50 millimeter and uh, saw the entire Great Lakes. Uh, a fifth or a quarter of all the world's fresh water is just laid out there. I grew up in that part of the world a lot of my time, but I'd never really thought about it like that, of, of just this uh, beautiful collection all the way from Superior right to the end of Lake Ontario in one glance. The, the trace of uh, the glaciers that uh, laid all that down 20,000 years ago. And you're also reminded that the world 
is alive. The world, the world is like the like superheated porridge with this little tiny thin skin on the top, with the little pustules burping through like you get on your porridge. And except in this case, it's magma and, and lava. And, and the little zits are things like Mount Etna, like is erupting right here. And my son Evan sent me an email saying, Dad, Mount Etna is erupting today. You got to take a picture of it. So I timed it right and just coming across the south of Italy, took a picture of uh, the Earth's skin problem. Right there. <laughs> and if you give enough people enough money and enough time, <laughs> They will do some really strange things. They'll uh, create Beakerhead if you give them enough time <laughs> and enough money. So if you fly over Dubai, you just got to look down and shake your head and go, what are those people doing down there? <laughs> you instantly know when you're over this part of the world, which is uh, the outback of Australia. It is the most blasted, uh, time-worn, uh, desiccated part of the whole planet, where entire mountain ranges have been ground down over millions of years. You know, Australia has all, all so many poisonous animals, uh, the poisonous plants, and uh, it's the result of being separated from the rest of the world for eons, and it's really visible in the stark beauty of the, uh, of the outback. I couldn't believe it. This is just a guy like me grabbing a camera and taking a snapshot of what our world looks like. And the ability to do that, Jay, the chance to grab a camera and see our world in, uh, in infinite variety and color, but also, also because of technology, to be able to share it directly, immediately, with millions of people was both a tremendous personal thrill and an enormous privilege and responsibility. And I was really glad to be the lucky guy who got to do that. And you certainly carried it out. Yeah. Now, as I said earlier, we intend this to be an interactive evening, and Chris has been back on Earth for four months now, and while he's happy to be, I'm sure that he has powerful, emotional, lingering memories of what it's like to be on the ISS, and we want to try and recreate some of that for you. And we can take as a, a reference point the screen behind us, then I'm hoping that Chris will get a sense of just what we're trying to show. Imagine it's dark in the space station, you're orbiting, the Earth is turning, and you get some light. The sunrise on the station is so beautiful. You come from the darkness of night where, where the Earth just has a glow, and then suddenly the the whole semi-circular hemisphere that is your view out the window starts to catch the early rays and it illuminates the upper atmosphere first and you get the knock to loosen clouds. And then because you're coming around the world so quickly, it's as if you drive into the sun and you burst over. But that first hint of the horizon of the world is, is an awakening 16 times a day on board. And uh, it's a beautiful big arc of life on our planet. And it looks really cool here in the theater. I like it. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you, light bearers. And the other thing, Chris, that uh, I suspect you do miss is weightlessness. What's that like? Weightlessness is like, like a toy that never winds down. It's like a gift that, that just keeps unwrapping itself all the time. It's so nice. It's a... Uh, it's like a superpower where you can suddenly fly and you can float. And when you're outside on a spacewalk and you're inside your spacesuit, you're actually floating weightless inside your spacesuit. If you can imagine what it's like to uh, be wearing something that is as hot and confining as this, where you're like a cork inside it floating and it's floating with you in space. Uh, I had a chance to do two spacewalks, and uh, it is a magical experience. Everyone here would love weightlessness, and when you come home, it just feels so unfair. 
<laughs> but it's a hard thing to recreate on Earth, weightlessness. We are going to recreate it right now with the help of everybody that's in the front couple of rows. If you could just gather around in the very narrow space in front of uh, your seats, we are going to send our astronaut <laughs> across slowly. They were all yellow. I came along. I wrote a song for you. And the things you do. And it was called yellow. So then I took my. This is a, a night of incredible variety. Is it not so far tremendous? And is it not so far curious? <laughs> Perhaps fortunately I didn't hear that comment. We are going to go now to something completely different but kind of along the lines of what you just saw with Compressor Head, which incidentally is a German heavy metal band, uh, and this is their first appearance ever in North America. So. And as much as I like the famous scientists, I'm not sure they can... <laughs> Th those did guys I don't see... have any feel. They don't have any feel. Did I see signs of resentment from... <laughs> The famous scientist. Hey, wait a minute, what's this? Look. This would also appear to be a robot. Uh, and there's a button, a green button. A red button. Now, if you're like me, you don't push red buttons. <laughs> but you might push the green button. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's talking to me. I'll let it ask that What's question. Your name? My name's Jay. There's no money and no law. What would be the first thing you would do? If there were no money and no law, what would be the first thing I would do? That's actually a fairly private question. 
But of course, when you're just talking to a little cardboard robot, I would sail around the world. Well, that isn't a very good answer, is it? I'm going to skip that question. What do you love most in the world? I love, what do I love most in the world? Mixing art, science, and engineering. That was an easy one. What is the last risk you took? The last risk I took was standing right here, right now, hoping that my band wouldn't get jealous of a robot band. If you could go back and tell yourself something as a child, what would it be? If I could go back and tell myself something as a child, <laughs> uh, this, is a, this interview is a little deep for me. Uh, I will uh, defer that to the next interview, okay? Now, I really strongly believe that this little robot did not get here by him or herself. And I suspect that there's a human behind this, and let's just bring out that human, Alex Rebin. The robot, always, the robot always steals the show away from me, I'm sure. Yes, they do. So this is Alex's creation. It's called a blab droid, and why don't you explain just what these are? Correct. So the, the blab droids actually are the world's first robot uh, documentary filmmakers. So we have 20 of these that go around uh, and find people and ask them interesting questions. And is it, is it true, as I suggested, that people uh, might be more prone to open up to a cute little blab droid like this? It's, it's pretty interesting what people say to it. Uh, it has, as you heard, has a very childlike voice. It's a very cute robot. Uh, maybe we should take a look at an example of what someone said okay, to it. Okay, so here's an example of what somebody said to a blab droid. If you died tomorrow, what would you regret the most? I switched out her shampoo for a nair hair remover when she wasn't looking and clumps of her hair fell out. I felt that she deserved it and it's very much so justified. And I would do it again to her in a heartbeat. I still don't like her. Pretty interesting, huh? You're, you're an interviewer many years, what do you think? Oh, uh, I, uh, yes, I have interviewed many times, but you know, maybe I'm too flesh and blood and not cute enough and not got these little robot eyes just staring innocently at me. So where do you deploy them? Uh, so we had a few in the uh, Tribeca Film Festival, and we had some in Amsterdam. Uh, there'll be some in Sweden in a couple of weeks. So we're taking them around the world to find out uh, about humans through the eyes of a robot. I found some interesting things like uh, people in Amsterdam, when asked who do you love the most, a lot of them say myself. But in New York, it's always my mother or someone else of that sort. So. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions. How did, how did you get the idea to create these? Uh, so it was interesting. So I was studying human-robot uh, symbiosis as part of my thesis at MIT. And we were trying to get people to do things like help a robot upstairs. And to do that, why not be cute and ask for help? Uh, but also a video camera inside. We were finding people were laying on the floor uh, that wandered into the lab off the street and was telling the robot their problems. Uh, so it was quite interesting. Uh, yeah, and since then, uh, the past you few know years, I it's. Think? <laughs> I think that. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, do, do you need a little time with the robot? Should I, should I step, step <laughs> up the side? <laughs> I want to have the robot to myself. <laughs> and, and so are you actually like putting together full length video documentaries? So we're, we're bringing these around the world. I'm actually uh, teamed up with an artist and filmmaker named Brent Hoff. Um, that's his seven-year-old kid on the robot. Um, he's getting a lot smarter. He's asking for more uh, expensive toys in exchange for getting his voice on there. Um, but we're actually working on a, uh, a consumer version. So to really make this project huge, we want to get this out to everyone. And while they may not film people, we want them to interact and learn from humans in a way that that data can go online. And uh, not just here and now, but uh Tomorrow, I think, and the next day, perhaps, uh, certainly in the f next two days of Beakerhead, your blab droids are going to be roaming around. Yeah, so at Beaker Night, there'll be two of these guys going around with a couple volunteers, and you'll have a chance to talk to them yourselves. So I would advise all of you, if you go to Beaker Night tomorrow night, and I would strongly suggest that, that you sort of prepare in advance. Don't be ready to divulge everything. Make sure you understand what are family secrets and personal secrets, because the blab droid We'll find out. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you.
control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Lock your Soyuz hatch and put your helmet on. Ten. Ground control Nine. to Major Tom. Eight. Seven. Six. Commencing five, countdown engine four, song. Three. Two. Detach from station five, and may God's love be with you.
Chris Hatfield, Lauren Siegel, Dan Leviton, a tremendous and curious speaker head. Thank you. Let me introduce the band. Thanks for coming, everybody. Nelson Bulnich. Greg Kennedy on the keys. Steve Dawn on lead guitar. Rob Polish on drums. I'm Trevor Day. Jay Ingram. Thanks so much to Jack and Terry on sound. The light crew. for helping us and picking up these lovely outfits as well. To all of you for making Pick Your Head happen. Look what you did, Calgary. Look what you did. Marianne Moser, you did it too. Thank you.